long as they believe everything is acceptable. Lies, slander, and the most shameless embellishment of the truth, just to achieve the goal. I read these words from Nietzsche's book, The Will to Power. This purpose can also be served by the instructions, guided by which the command gives orders and spreads rumours, conducts propaganda in whispers. Indeed, everything is being done to preserve and strengthen our confidence. From the Führer's headquarters we hear the words. The army can be convinced that I will do everything to ensure that it is appropriately provided for and timely unblocked. And Manstein radios hold out, the Führer will get you out. These are completely official state which are communicated to all soldiers, and in turn give rise to rumours passed from mouth to mouth, from battalion to battalion, from one wall of the cauldron to another. To believe them, the tank vanguards are already at Karpovka, we can see the fire of their shot, and the Russians are on the eve of their imminent destruction. Someone has used the word cockade, a three-layer cockade. It should be understood as follows. Inside you, us, around us in a ring. The Russians and around them, the German divisions which are already coming to our rescue. They listen willingly because they believe. It's a big thing. Faith, and especially for us, trapped in the cauldron, the hand clenches the rifle more firmly, the eye takes the sight more accurately, and it is easier to starve for a few more days. In this way the will to resist and the strength of defence are strengthened for a while. Smoke and smoke stand over the big Volga city. Fortress Stalingrad, so it is called now in the orders, in the reports of the Wehrmacht High Command and German newspapers. It sounds good, but there is nothing that would justify this name for us, instead of pillboxes and bunkers. We have snow pits instead of anti-tank ditches, frozen rivers instead of ammunition depots, a handful of cartridges instead of mountains of food, skinny horses. But Fortress Stalingrad sounds much more spectacular than just Stalingrad. Why not a little and not exaggerate, if it will raise morale? They take advantage of the gullibility of a frontline soldier. It is necessary to present him the case in such a way that he will continue to fight to the last bullet. Some headquarters maintain good spirits in other ways. For example, in one division, keep a report card calendar of the encirclement, crossing out in it with a red pencil every day that has passed, and next to it, for comparison, a diary of the battles for the hill, where the Russians encircled Shearer's group. The officers are proud of each day crossed out, which brings them closer to breaking the record of the home group. Why, perhaps they will indeed succeed in breaking it. It's the thrill of the sport. So everyone has their own worries, while the bulk, straining their eyesight, gazing westward to be the first to report on the long-awaited appearance of the first German tanks, such a group of officers would willingly sit in the cauldron for a few more weeks, out of a desire for sensation, out of a desire to seize the opportunity to climb higher up the ladder of success and perhaps rank. And in any case to boast later of his heroism, bought at the cost of blood and starvation death of entire regiments, and to show off his chest, decorated with new orders and medals. There are rumours that a special Stalingrad medal and a special arm patch will be established. People on the street will turn around and respectfully removing his hat, saying, Look, he is one of the heroes of Stalingrad. But the soldier masses no longer have any special ambition. What to her all these new pieces of metal or motley ribbons on the uniform? Orders have lost their value for these soldiers, mean nothing to them. After all, the criteria in the different branches of the Wehrmacht and even in individual armies are different. Behind the most insignificant cross is sometimes more courage than the most outstanding award for bravery. It's especially critical of the common soldier to the orders, which are worn on a ribbon around the neck. They are awarded to the highest officers. The command receives orders for the successes of subordinate units and formations. Regiments and battalions are thrown again and again into senseless battle, because the German general at all costs wanted the Knight's Cross. The Romanian division commander, the Order of Mihai the Brave, and the Croatian colonel S. von Gemia. Therefore, the soldier looks at these orders with an ambivalent feeling. He knows that they cost him too much sacrifice. Our doctor, it was during the battles for Shopno, for, made a reasonable suggestion. Give out all the general's orders at the beginning of the war, and at each stupidity committed, at each defeat and heavy losses, take away one. There would be fewer idiotic orders and we have plenty of them now. Combat units of the division daily suffer losses in the small war for shops, basements and stairwells. They do not receive replenishment. The only thing we can do to help them is to reinforce the wire and mine barriers. That's what we, the sappers, are for. 
A miracle happens. After the transfer of the site to the infantry, we are withdrawn from the territory of the factory and concentrated in the area of the flower pot. Fiedler returns too. His task is accomplished. The gunners and carriers who he trained in rifle shooting and infantry fighting are distributed among the companies. The first of them have already been killed. Paul is glad to be with us again. He missed us as much as we missed him. Now it's time again for mining, setting up wire fences, sending flamethrower and explosive teams to the front line, and every day we have to make big marches back and forth. But still people are happy that at least an hour can rest in the dugouts. The number of troops is decreasing all the time. They promise reinforcements. I don't know where it will come from. We have to wait. As for our equipment and property, it is barely enough for even the most necessary work. By order of the army headquarters, I had to thoroughly empty our supplies to help the sappers on the western front of the cauldron, who during the retreat in the bend of the Dun lost all their shovel tools. This transfer of shovels from battalion to battalion is now called patronage. And just at the moment when the number of active bayonets is decreasing every day, and there are fewer and fewer soldiers in the trenches on the front line, when there is no ammunition, no fuel, no equipment, and everything is aimed at limiting and transferring weapons and property to others. We are suddenly sent new flamethrowers. Hell knows where they came from. Probably some Riyanarpaznab storehouse. We don't need them now, especially since the bright minds from the wrecked forgot to send us the necessary apparatuses to fill them with fuel mixture. I call other battalions, talk to the commanders. Everywhere the same thing. Finally, at my request, the Chief of Engineers of the Army responds that in the entire boiler there is no such apparatus. I have to get it myself somewhere. Earlier such a story would have angered me, but now I am indifferent. After all, this is just one fact among many, an extra proof that we are doing well only as long as we move forward. But woe if the situation changes. 15.0 Oberfeldfe Belbernt has just left me with signed orders. All battle orders for tonight have been given. At 16.0, a team led by Oberfell Fichtbell Dannenbauer goes out to work on equipping and reinforcing the positions in front of Shopno. 18.16.30, Oberfell's Bell Lizer's group comes out. It will mine the strip in front of workshop No. At 20.0, Eichler's regiment will send for ready wire spiles. Motti calls Staffel Fury luck to me. Luke is in charge of our barbed wire fence factory which we set up in the White House. The wire spirals are gone, and they can hardly be airlifted, for there are things far more important. So our stunted horses carry the sleds back and forth all day long. Three soldiers load them with remnants of wire mesh fences, telephone wires, and all sorts of wire ends lying around on the roads. Any wire will come in handy now, all the soldiers who are not fully combat ready, lightly wounded, sick and elderly, are busy at the factory laking slingshots and spirals, which are taken to the front line at night and strengthen the defence system. They are pulled out of the trenches so that the enemy will not notice anything. Joined together and with disguised explosive charges, they constitute quite a considerable obstacle. In front of our positions have already laid 500 metres of spiral. The matter has paid off. During the twisting of the wire, people are not under the enemy's aiming fire. They do not have to duck all the time. Do not have to listen fearfully to every rustle. Luke makes barbed wire simply out of nothing. Out of throwaway material, he creates a protective rampart for the infantry. His daily casualties are down too, but there are hours when casualties are higher than normal. The enemy now puts a couple more batteries into action before an attack than before. Like everything else in the world, the organization of the wire factory has two sides. If through it we have saved a little manpower, we lose two and three times as much by the enemy's massive fire raids. Nothing in essence has changed for the better for us. Only the daily routine has moved a bit. I took a hat, went out of the dugout to get some fresh air. The day in its eternally relentless westward movement has already left the banks of the Volga. Sleepy stars shine in the sky through a thin veil of clouds. In the east, one after another, rockets fly up to the sky to illuminate the neutral strip. White on our side and slightly yellowish on the Russian side, depending on where the light is coming from, the shadows of the snow-covered ruins of buildings, boarded up garages and short stovepipes of dugouts change their shape and direction. They grow and fall, become sharper or fainter, to disappear altogether in a matter of seconds on the horizon. The muzzle flame of the artillery batteries striking from the eastern bank of the Volga jumps out in ominous leaps. 
It is yellow-reddish and quickly extinguishes. From a nearby section of the factory grounds comes the dry Takania of machine guns. The machine guns are Russian, you can tell by the somewhat slower rate of fire. Then between machine gun bursts, automatic rifles click. Flares and fading this is the front breathing. At times the icy air is shaken by the bursts of heavy shells. Then a growing and then fading rumble gives away the airplane circling above us. In the direction of the airfield, the parachutes of glowing aerial bombs hang in the air. Here is another one, the second, the third. They burn in the sky like torches, illuminating the snowy plain with milky yellow light. At the Tata rampart, car headlights suddenly flare up, despite the increasing shelling and single bombs. It is right, a truck that has lost its way, looking for a well-traveled trail. In the same direction, only thousands of kilometers farther away, lies Germany. Suddenly a shadow emerges from the darkness. Starfeld Felder Luke is here on your orders. Good evening, Luke. I wanted to know how many wire spirals we have at our disposal. Hmm. Seventy, Mr. Captain. The men have done a good job. Oh. Good. Beichler's regiment will pick up fifty at the White House at 0 p.m. Tonight. Order what you need. Yes, Mr. Captain. He's hesitating. He won't leave. I have one question. Spit it out. What about the de-blockade? Mr. Captain? Same question. I can't answer that. If the Army Command would at least see fit to inform the pass, I can't tell him what I think myself. Well, you know, Luke, that's a question I can't either. You know how long it takes to concentrate and deploy an entire army. The Russians are so strong now you can't take half measures. That's why it's going slower. According to the latest reports, Goth is on its way. But don't believe everything they say, Luke. It's a disappointment. I'm not a child, Mr. Captain. It's just that you're in a very stupid position. You can't tell people anything sensible when they ask. He's right. That staff will fill Bill Luke. But I can't help him. Division headquarters is playing the silent treatment. Promises are plentiful. They're not stingy with words. But the deeds, the immutable facts, make them wait for a long time. You can't rely on rumours and talk. I'm saying goodbye to Luke. I knocked the snow off my boots with my heels and rubbing my frozen hands went down to the dugout. Jo wo, Mr. General, Jo wo, Jo o, my adjutant puts the receiver on the lever. What is it? The general called. We have two companies of Romanians under our command. The commanders will arrive tomorrow morning. In addition, a company of bakers is being transferred to us immediately. They are to start setting up a fallback position along the railroad line. A reserve position. Those words are new to me. And bakers. I wish they'd bake bread and bread again. We need it. But Berger enlightens me. The division has no more flour. So the baker's company is unemployed. Now it can be used for earthworks. One, two, march to build an extra line of defense in the rear. What's the situation with the tools? Dough mixers are no good here. Did you tell the general that? The bakers will take the dough mixers with them. The company commander. The company is to arrive tomorrow at 7 a.m. At the intersection of the road to Razgulievka and White Houses with the railroad line. Have Rem Bold take command. After dinner, have him report to me on the progress of the work. Then call Eichler at 0 p.m. His men can take 50 wire spirals from the White House. Jiao Wall, Mr. Captain. I'm going into the next room. On the table are the papers I received today. I take a quick look. New designations of targets. Instructions on the order of presentation to the ranks. The allocation of orders to us. Orders for further coming of rear services. The reduction of food rationing two letters. But even today there is no most important message. Where are the saving words? The operation to unblock is developing successfully. The Russians are retreating in front of the German tank rampart. Goth, 10 kilometers from Stalingrad? Yes, slowly. Very slowly advancing troops coming from the direction of Rostov. The lifeline thrown to us seems to be too light to reach us. It will not be long before our last cry for help is heard. And then the drowning Paulus will disappear into the waves. And the whole army with him. The most beautiful straws cannot hold hundreds of thousands of people on the surface of the raging sea. No promises or radiograms can help. With anger, I pushed the stack of papers aside. Leaning against the boardwalk, I read the letters. One from my wife. The handwriting on the second envelope is unfamiliar to me. 
I look at the sender's address, Kiel Blankenstein. Aha, the father of my friend Wolfgang. I tear open the envelope and read. The old man remembers his murdered son. The image of Oberleutnant Wolfgang Kiel comes back to me. A bullet in the head ended his life near... For the first time Wolfgang was shy here before the task assigned to him. The evening before the attack, he came to me and honestly admitted that with great reluctance goes to this operation, as if he had a premonition. If my father had known about it, his grief would have been even greater, and if he had learned in addition that almost the entire company of his son died there, would he continue to be proud of him? Or would he have been even more horrified? But at least Kiel really died from a bullet to the head, and I didn't have to make up anything, and how often you have to write about a bullet in the head or in the heart, about instant death just to comfort relatives. Kiel's father could indeed be comforted. His son died without agony, died for a few shrubby square metres on the Don. There are fewer and fewer of those with whom I started the war. New soldiers came to take their place, bad and good. Rembold and Fetzer, they're the same breed as Kiel. I wish they hadn't been killed so quickly, but here in Stalingrad sooner or later for everyone will come a moment when there is no more escape from death. Today for one, tomorrow for another, the day after tomorrow may be for me. That's why I want to sit alone, and my thoughts more and more often go there, back. And then all those questions come upon me that recede during the day under the onslaught of orders, worries, attacks and reports. What, in fact, have I lived for up to now? Who has benefited in any way from my life? There is no hiding behind all these excuses, behind all these if-onlys. All that matters is what was and is. I cannot tell myself that my life is a mistake, a bad joke that should not be taken seriously. No, I must ride life, fulfill my destiny. But war has taken up too much space in my life. And if it, this war is meaningless, it means that all the years behind me are also meaningless. More than that, it means I'm on the wrong ship and the captain is an imposter. And as an officer, I'm helping him sink his entire crew. When you think about it, it makes your head spin. The next morning, two gentlemen in high winter Romanian hats stand in front of me. They are the commanders of two Romanian companies subordinate to me. They are enveloped in a cloud of cologne. Despite their moustaches, they look rather bubbly. The features of their tanned faces with chubby shaved cheeks are blurred. The uniforms are neat and reminiscent of winter sports or of FIFO cloak or Picardine. The cut is impeccable and they fit perfectly. It is obvious that they were sewn by fashionable tailors from Bucharest. Sheepskin coats on top of the uniforms. After I saw demoralized, fleeing Romanian units in a big bend of the Don, their appearance amazes me. I never expected such well-fed and well-dressed reinforcements. Okay, so two companies. 120 men each. One thing I don't understand is the statement of both officers that their units are incapacitated due to poor nutrition and exhaustion. Judging by the commanders, something doesn't look like it. I have to look at the soldiers myself. First of all, it is necessary to point out to them the area of placement of the ravines stretching from the flower pot to the white houses. Berger would show them, having given orders for the afternoon and promising to bring my battalion doctor with me to help the wounded and sick. I finish my conversation with both company men. Having eaten together with the doctor and Birch, I set off. Distance of half a kilometer, we go on foot. In a few minutes we go down the slope of the cliff and now we are standing among the Romanians. They round like shadows are gaunt soldiers, exhausted, tired, unshaven, overgrown with dirt. Their uniforms are worn out, their overcoats too. Bandages on heads, legs and arms meet us at every turn. The doctor's face expresses despair everywhere despite the obvious physical weakness. They are working, building dugouts, saws are ringing, axes are taking off. Others are chopping wood. It will take a lot of it to heat the holes dug in the frozen ground and to melt the ice on the walls. They look at us with curiosity. You can read the soldiers' thoughts on their faces. What do they want here? These Germans? No sooner had we arrived than this damn type is already here, sniffing out what we are doing. Leave us alone at last. If we could do as we please, we would show you. We turn the corner, and I stop like a stumbling block. I can't believe it. In front of me is a carefully built, smoky field kitchen, protected from the wind by boarded walls, and on top of it, with his sleeves rolled up to his elbows, sits Captain Popescu himself, stirring soup with a rolling pin. There is no trace of the elegance that struck me in the morning. Only the cheeky face has remained the same. But that is not surprising when you can get into soldiers' wokes. Pope Shu is so engrossed in his cooking 
that he only notices us when we get close to the cauldron. He jumps down on the snow, wipes his hands on his work pants, and explains his strange behaviour. Hey, I have to do it myself. You can't let anyone near the food at this hour. Please wait a minute. I'll be right back. He calls the lieutenant, hands him the sceptre and invites us into his dugout. The doctor goes about his business to examine the whole company in the neighbouring dugout and determine the fighting ability of each soldier. The doctor leaves and Popescu and I discuss the future use of the company. I do not trust the ability of Romanian soldiers to handle German mines and therefore I want to involve them in earthworks in the rear and that, at most, Povzvodno. Firstly, it is clear from the divisional order that they are not trusted upstairs. Secondly, I think it is better if they will be with a few of our units, well familiar with the terrain, and besides to work in the city in groups larger than a platoon is risk. Too big would be a target. The company commander has no idea about the vast majority of his soldiers. It is formed from all sorts of units. It has gunners and gunners along with soldiers who in military service only know how to bake buns or clean horses, you have to be ready for anything with them. From tomorrow they will be on the battalion's payroll, then I will be better oriented in all matters. We're going to the next dugout, where the doctor has gone. We wade through the anteroom packed to the limit with people, in which there is an unbearable odour of sweat and decay. The doctor is scrambling around, Birch handing him bandages, syringes, tweezers. The air is stale, both of them have drops of sweat on their foreheads. I get closer and see the doctor unwinding the bandage on the wounded man's hand. We have to amputate the index finger. Iodine, bandage, ready. Almost everyone's got something. Gunshot wounds, broken bones, shrapnel wounds, dysentery, jaundice, frostbite and suppuration. A continuous series of human suffering. And who does not have this? The general condition is such that there is no health to speak of. Sluggish and slouching, these shadows stand in line to see the doctor. Their ribs are sticking out like a washboard. The skin on their necks and collarbones is sagging, and their thighs are as thick as their arms. If I didn't need so much help, I'd give up on these people altogether. You can't ask much of them. But the situation at the moment is such that every shovel of excavated earth, every meter of installed wire, every hole for a mine is a great relief to us. That's why the doctor examines them so thoroughly. Ink, surname, age, state of health. Such thoroughness takes time. I see it will last a few more hours. There is nothing to think of visiting the second Romanian company. Captain Bratenu will receive medical attention tomorrow. Popescu will warn him. Although I am invited to dinner, I have to depart. The fat commander already disgusts me with his fawning courtesy. Besides, it would be swine to take a few portions away from hungry soldiers. We, Feidler, Berger and I, are already sitting down to dinner when the doctor returns. He looks exhausted. The report he makes to me is quite consistent with the expression on his face. Out of 120 men, at least 90 are incapacitated, half of them completely unfit for military service. And all this together is called reinforcements. We are still talking when the door opens. Two Romanian soldiers come in. Completely tattered overcoats hang on their bony shoulders like on a hanger. One has a fresh bandage on his head. The other holds his sheepskin cap in his hands so that his black hair falls over his pale forehead. They look around, assume the posture of street singers in some Berlin backyard, and with uncertain voices, they drag out a long folk song from their last strength. Longing and pleading, faith and hope sound in its low tones, and we, though we did not understand a word, heard in it the pain of people torn away from home, the love for their native land, the dream of happiness. This melody no matter how naive it is, as if opened my eyes. In the words of a foreign language, the same feelings that we feel or in fact should feel. And strangely enough, I feel compassion for these poor guys who sang us their sad song. A few hours earlier I had seen their company and thought only of its use. And now these two had somehow thrown me off my usual equilibrium, though I had seen quite a lot of sadness on various fronts. Perhaps here, in my dugout, I am more accessible to human grief. Perhaps today I have seen too much of it to pass idly by. So it is as if I live a double life. I am a commander, and at the same time in the few quiet hours I indulge in my own thoughts. But I can't go any further than that. What for the army means a cauldron, for me in these hours means an oath, obedience, and a search for a way out. And that is my stumbling block. Romanians eat. You can't look at them without pity. 
But who can say that we ourselves would not have the same pitiful look now if we ourselves had been at Kletskaya then? Would we have held our positions today in all splendor? Those who sent those Romanians to fight here are fools and arrogant types, who think that they are still omnipotent and can get out of any situation. I wish they had at least given the Romanians modern anti-tank guns instead of a couple of pathetic 37mm cannons. Maybe then things would look different today. But that's the way it is with everything. The Germans are the crown of creation and lords of all things. We alone are the good soldiers. We are everything and everyone. What do the others exist for? For quiet parts of the front, for plugging gaps like mincemeat for cutlets. That's what they're good for. Yes, they're good for us. Instead of large caliber shells, we'll give five or six knights crosses to their commanders. We'll publish pictures in the newspapers with long comments. All this, of course, is very attractive to them. We need soldiers. We look down on them, but with some differences. Our staffs absolutely despise the Romanians. We, the other officers, don't think very highly of them either because they can't be relied on, and our soldiers even sympathize with them a little, if after three years of war one can still speak of such mental movements at all, and at any rate feel something like pity for them. But what effect will all this have on the Romanians? After all, these peasant boys must have noticed that in the German we Wehrmacht, the opinion of the common soldier means exactly nothing. They know that the decisive thing is the attitude of the headquarters, that these headquarters express the official point of view. Armenians are second-class soldiers, but we need them. With our arrogant stupidity and swagger, we insult others and cause hatred towards our people. But hatred and fear are a poor basis for the brotherhood of arms that is so necessary here. On the front lines, and we wonder why foreign divisions don't fight well, all we hear around us is those shitty soldiers, body souls, macaroni, cowardly rabble. But only very few people think about the fact that they, these soldiers, do not know what they are fighting for, and this deprives them of their fighting spirit and offensive impulse, gives birth to indifference in them. Perhaps it is enough to give these peoples a goal worth laying down one's life for, and they will fight like lions. But have we given them such a goal? The two Romanian soldiers press their food. We give them the remaining slices of bread, a couple of slices of sausage and some jam. We don't have any butter ourselves, but we have a bowl of soup. It's a little sour now, but they'll like it. Hunger's the best cook. It'll ennoble even the most liquid soup, as long as there's food. And if there isn't, hunger rummages through garbage buckets, crouches over piles of potato peelings and nibbled bones, sniffs under other men's doors, at dugouts, at every dugout from where there is light. I can't treat the singers properly. The rations are too small. Our supplies are running low. And what is given out daily? We eat ourselves. 100 grams of horse meat, 15 grams of peas, 150 grams of bread, 3 grams of butter, 2 grams of fried coffee, and another 100 grams of horse meat for dinner. To this are added 3 cigarettes, 2 sticks of candy, and if we are lucky, sometimes a bar of coca-cola and a smudge of jam. Potatoes, vegetables, canned meat, sausage. Cheese, flour, pudding, powder, sugar, salt, spices, alcoholic beverages have all become concepts that have lost all reality for us. They are objects of recollection that only burden the memory and the appetite, and yet, compared to the rear services, we are still nothing. Now two food standards have been introduced. For units on the front line, up to and including battalion headquarters, and another, starting with the regimental commander, the will of the soldiers behind, food is counted almost by the milligram and the belt is tightened to the limit. Our situation is bearable so far, as the cook has saved a little in the previous weeks, and besides, we have slaughtered the cart horses. That's why I managed to feed the unexpected guests a little today. They look at me with gratitude, and when they get a cigarette, their faces light up with happiness. I take a moment to ask them about their service in their company. They complain bitterly. I find out that Pope Sicu was not accidentally working today at the cauldron of the field kitchen, he does it day in and day out. He distributes the dry rations himself, cooks them himself, gives out the food himself. So he has his own special system here. First of all, the officers' kettles are filled with meat and beans, almost without liquid. Then it's the non-commissioned officers' turn. They fish the rest of the gruel out of the cauldron, and all that remains is warm, tasteless water for the privates. That's the rule. Pupsku himself, a Romanian boyar, sees to it that it is strictly observed in exchange for missing food beatings. 
Corporal punishment has not yet been abolished in the Romanian army. Even for the slightest offence, the offender is put on a bench and whipped. This old method has not been abandoned even now, after severe fighting and panic retreat. A soldier will still get his share of beatings, no matter if he is wounded or sick, frostbitten or even amputated. It is clear to me that the soldier's morale is not raised, only their hatred of officers. Well, I would change this matter at least in the two companies subordinate to me, and immediately. Whoever is destined to lay down his head here must not be beaten. Romanian peasant boys have no rest. They're busy from morning till night. They not only have to serve and please their company and platoon commanders, but to get for them the most unthinkable things to create a cosy in the officers' dugouts. More to the point, whole platoons are busy doing things that no ordinary mortal would ever think of doing. Popescu is an old sport rider and therefore cannot be separated from his race mare Mademoiselle. He leads her with him in a cart from position to position, from Romania to the Don, and from the Don to us. Wherever his company is, the noble animal must be fed, and better than a private of his company. Today, forty soldiers are busy building a stable, a special stable for the captain's favourite. It's more spacious and warmer than any soldier's shelter. There stands a mare, as tired and gaunt as any living creature in the cauldron, but with her neither day nor night does not let down the eyes of a special groom, who is obliged to see that nothing happens to the commander's favourite. At about a midnight I go down to my dugout. In the next room sit together with Oberfelfi, Bell, Birch, Emig and Tony. They are also talking about our Romanian neighbours. About our Romanian neighbours. Birch talks about today's physical examination and the state of the Romanian company. Tony is angry and speaks so loudly that I can hear every word. Hey, I wish he'd try that with me. I wouldn't let him whip my ass, but I'd knock him dead. You don't believe what you're saying, says Emig. You're too slow-witted for that. The others don't even think about it. They've always been hit. They're used to it. What do you mean they're used to it? Are they used to freezing, eating cabbage slop and dying? Nah, those poor guys have it a lot worse than we do. Why do they put up with all this? Maybe they think they can take Red October or a couple of other corners in this town? But it's too late for them. Don't yell like that. What about you? Maybe you think you'll get a villa on the Volga? What did you come here for? That's a different matter. If Ivan wanted to attack us, we had to defend ourselves. But if he wasn't going to attack us, as many people say nowadays, then it didn't make sense. Then it turns out it was Adolf himself who started the whole thing, and what could we Germans do? Let's follow him. Let's go. There's no difference between us, but the Romanians nobody did anything to them, and they didn't start the war. So they just got their balls screwed in. And it's clear. It didn't work out. Listen to them and you'll see they don't even know why they were brought here. Now Birch comes into the conversay. Exactly. Two Romanians told me themselves. They're fed up? They want to go home and let us fight our own war? Yeah, that makes sense. I can see why the infantry refuse such reinforcements. You can't leave them in the front line. I wonder what our old man will do with this rabble. Next morning, our doctor goes to Britannia's company. I asked him to send this commander together with Popescu to me during the day. We must have a word with them. Two hours later they came with flushed faces, puffing and pouring sweat. Why am I interfering in the internal affairs of their units? But it's necessary. First of all, I forbid corporal punishment. Secondly, I send to each company its cook, who will take over the preparation and distribution of food, both hot and dry rations. In addition, after work, the soldiers are allowed to occupy themselves with any other business, only to a very limited extent. I remind you of the stables and the equipping of the officers' dugouts. Finally, I order the two captains, with all able-bodied men, to report to the White House, be on the spot in full readiness at 17.0, bring your tools. I'll make the deployment personally. The results of the medical examination reported to me by the doctor this afternoon are somewhat more comforting than yesterday's. Britannu has 50 men who are semi-healthy and can be utilised. Together with Popsu's 30 soldiers, this is still 80 men who can be put to work. Exactly at 17.0, the Romanians arrive at the appointed place. Both commanders greet me and Franz. Russian artillery is hitting our lines and rear moderately today. On the local scale, of course, but compared to other parts of the front. In any case, the Romanians are ducking for cover. To avoid unnecessary casualties on the march, I'm ordering a scattered formation. 
The non-commissioned officers of my battalion, who are to watch the earthworks, let them move with them separately at a distance of 50 metres, together with Franz and both company commanders advance. Lift our companions after each rupture and get with them to the shop number five. A real torment. It takes twice as long as usual. Mayor, in the presence of the site commander, I specify both work to be done. The equipment of machine gun nests, digging communication passages and dugouts. Everything is clear. The only thing missing is the labour force, the Romanians. I want to wait for them, hand over further leadership to Franz and leave. There are five men missing from the first squad that came up. The non-commissioned officer assumes that they are lying in hiding along the road and will still come up. We wait, but no one else from this group appears. The other squads are no better. Comes non-commissioned officer Trapman with a soldier, one and only one. Now all the squad leaders are there, and there are only 28 soldiers. We wait another half an hour, but no soldiers arrive. Of the disappeared soldiers, I don't see anyone else. Only to the west of the White Houses we catch up with a group of four men who are dragging something like a sledge behind them. I take a closer look. Three dead men are lying on two chipped boards, two with their heads forward, one back. The stiffened bodies are just thrown on the boards and tied to them. Arms and legs are dragging straight through the snow. Human life is worth little here, and the dead even less. The Romanians seem to have it the same way. The next day all able-bodied soldiers are in place because now only those who participate in the work get food. The prohibition of corporal punishment and the management of our two cooks do their job, so that after a few days the two companies can be spoken of as real units. To make them work better, we have to give them more food. We can't trust both company commanders with food, so the little that is to be given out has to be given to our men themselves. A precaution can't hurt. Only those who work in front get a supplement. But now the Romanian soldiers are really getting down to business. They're digging, pulling barbed wire, helping wherever they can. Only once do I have to intervene. A few days later, I suddenly notice something darkening on the slope of the gully. I stop the car, go over. It turns out that it is lying on the planks of the corpses of the three killed on the first day. Four soldiers dragging makeshift sledges did not have enough strength to drag their dead comrades to the location of the company or to the cemetery. It became dark, nothing could be seen, the sleds overturned with their load, boards and corpses rolled down the slope and remained lying there. I read morals to the company, but I feel out of place myself. The Romanians to whom my words are translated look at me reproachfully. Or am I imagining it? After all, I forbade corporal punishment, sent them two cooks, made sure they were not chased around. They have more rest now, they must admit that. But I threatened them with food deprivation, do I not thus drive them forward into the territory of the factory directly under fire, where the shells do not distinguish between Germans and Romanians? Why do they need it? And I stand here in front of them and teach them how to treat dead men. No wonder they look at me like that. At the soldiers' cemetery in Gorodish, I can see how dulled my senses are. The rows of graves already go beyond the fences, and the more graves, the more the souls of the living become coarser whereas the divisional chaplain used to perform the burial service by arrangement. There are now special hours set for it. They are to be observed by anyone who still attaches any importance to the dead being laid in the grave with the words of scripture. Together with Feidler I stand in the evening in this cemetery, the size of which speaks of the severity of the fighting. We want to see off the field officer and six soldiers on their last journey, but don't even realise that it is done this way now. In front of us, thirty freshly dug graves, in them are already lying corpses. Smordad Crum ready exhausted ourselves. Nobody drives us forward any more. We don't hear the howling and rumbling of mines and shells, the cracking of machine guns, the whistling of bullets. It's good to lie here and not to know the war any more, not to ask ourselves the same question for a. Will I come home in one piece? It's not so bad for us. It's not so bad for us. We are happy, we are free. We have experienced our deliverance, we can say. Everything is behind us, envy us, you who stand above us. The priest approaches and his words are already heard. He's in a hurry. Every minute there could be an air raid. He mumbles words from the Old and New Testament, from the prayer book, from the book of church hymns. He preaches a sermon on the duty of the good camaraderie and on heroic death as a sacred sacrifice in the name of the Fury, the people and the Reich. In the name of the Fury, the people in the Reich. This is repeated many times as if we were already in doubt. 
but the pater is clearly acting according to a pattern, whether he wants it or not, for him it has become a matter of routine and daily routine. Today at 2 p.m. he has to serve at the cemetery, and since he is here, everything goes on as it did yesterday, as it did the day before yesterday, as it will go on tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, always. Every day it's the same. The only thing that changes is the number of those who are put in graves and who don't know it all anymore. Sometimes there are eighty a day, sometimes a hundred and sometimes only thirty. And those waiting for their turn behind the fence do not become less. It's all the same. Remember, man, that you are but dust and will turn to dust again. Amen. And even at this very moment, those who will be laid in the frozen ground tomorrow are dying. In the name of the Führer, the people, and the Rick. Amen. Right next to us, twenty paces away, the grave diggers are digging new holes. It's a dog's job to chisel the frozen ground two meters deep. They spit on their hands, and now ten graves are ready. We must soon there will be a new wagon with the dead, and where to put them. We must have graves to spare. We are already fifty corpses lying unburied. When the priest does not notice, they put a couple or even more dead in one grave. It's better to dig one grave deeper than several more. Saves labor. And on the birch cross above the grave will write, Here lies Fritz Muller. The one who lies under it won't complain anyway. Relatives from Berlin won't come to the grave anyway. Get to work, and into the next hole, a three. Pater won't notice. He only sees that everything is in line. Rows of graves and rows of birch crosses. He takes the prayer book in his hands, lowers his eyes and prays, then raises his eyes to the sky and speaks of heroic death. And he says a salute in honour of Germany, which is always the case. Let her live, my dear. But here they only die. One by one, in sections, companies, regiments, whole divisions. For Germany. For what? In the name of the Führer, the people and the wreck. I've heard those words once before with the same insistence. That was in 1937. And the one who uttered them was then called the first soldier of the German Reich. Frozen in formation, we stood in front of the Kurhaus in Wiesbaden. The commander and two officers, the standard bearers on the sides. For the parade allocated units of the entire corps. The sun was shining, steel helmets gleamed in its rays, and over the square rumbled a firm voice. He reminded us of the past, of our fathers, who in 1914 went to the battlefield for God, the Emperor, and Fatherland. He called on us, the sons, not to shame the honour of our fathers, and to march on the battlefield with the same courage for the Führer, the people, and the wreck. It fell to us to fulfil the most honourable task of the nation, the defence of the homeland, the protection of its borders. And then the commander-in-chief of the army, Colonel General Fritsch, went around the formation. He stopped in front of each unit commander and personally handed him a banner. The orchestra played the Prussian Gloria, the drums rattled, a forest of banners fluttered in white, red, black, gold, and pink colours. For me it was then the high point of my officer's life. Moreover, our black banner was really beautiful. White silk edging and iron cross gave it in my eyes dignity and strength. I was eager to serve under it, always to be on guard and not to spare my life. Only the swastika scattered in the corners of the banner embarrassed me. True, it was not very conspicuous. If you wanted, you could even ignore it, but it was there. And that meant politics, which I wanted nothing to do with. That's why I became a soldier. Only five years had passed. What has happened since that day? First, the Colonel General himself, the very one who had presented us with the satin banners, was given his resignation. Then his successor Brochich was deposed, and Hitler himself took over the army. Since then, the Iron Cross on the banner faded and the swastika became more and more visible. Even on the uniform's German cross, we already called party badge for the short sighty. It looks similar to this badge. After all, I wanted nothing to do with all this. And it's a bit far to defend Germany's borders here on the Volga. But who asks us if we want it? And since we ourselves do not ask anything, the we her marked has become an instrument of force, which reacts mechanically to everything and which, as it is put back into action year after year, is slowly but surely dulling. The pictures taken by the frontline officers of our division and their recollections can perhaps make you think. Here is a soldier's cemetery near the western rampart. Here are three cemeteries in France. Here are six in the east. And all these are cemeteries of our division alone. One of the 200 or 250, I don't know exactly, field divisions of the German army. It is not difficult to calculate how long it will take, when the last cemetery will take the last, 
Still alive soldiers and over their graves will no longer grow a forest of new crosses. They continue to die. For a whole month now this so-called fortress has been under siege, around which a rampart of corpses towers. Every day it grows higher. Whole regiments have already fallen here to the glory of the German army. This truly unheard of mass murder, this deliberate march to death and destruction hurls us like a chip in the storm. Heart and mind are trying to understand what is happening, to fight against it, but cannot comprehend it, swinging between and against coming closer and closer to the truth. The question why is impossible to answer. It has long been clear to me that we are defending a hopeless position. We should have at least foreseen it. But what would have changed? And what exactly does life even mean? It ends some day anyway. But if this death, this sacrifice, had any meaning, behind in the rear they are probably building a new line of defence and we are to serve as a breakwater until it's built, for sure. No, probably. But wouldn't we bind the same? And maybe even larger Russian forces? If our entire Sixth Army began to withdraw to the West, for then the Red Army, not knowing our quite definite intentions, would be forced not only to throw strong divisions towards our troops and pursue us with motorised units, it would have to send out strong guards parallel to our movement to be able to parry any unexpected deviation. So even then there would still be the possibility of creating a new line of defence. Or does our command expect to master the new situation so as to knock the Russian trump cards out of their hands? Goth is approaching, there is no doubt about it now. Only the pace of approach is very slow, and all sorts of surprises are possible. They say Seedlitz a few days ago again said that the cauldron will never break through, neither from the inside nor from the outside. It can only last until mid-January, at best until early February, and then the end. But even if we assume that the advance of the unblocking troops from the direction of Rostov will be successful, do they seriously believe that we will hold out here for so long? Yes, kidneys cling to every scrap of land, that's true, but the soldiers lying under mortar fire today are not the soldiers who fought a month ago. Those have long since turned into frozen corpses which serve as a rampart of defence, a bullet-riddled berm, and those who are still standing in the trenches or looking through the embrasures are soldiers from the supply lines and rear services. One day there won't be any of them left. What then? Do hundreds of thousands really have to die for the sake of one point on the map? We must de terrible thought comes into my head. We must die here because they want us to, a monstrous thought, like but with the methods of our propaganda and its love of beautiful words about sacrificial death. The death of our army, rightly so, is very useful to spur the people tired of war and cause in them fanaticism, thirsting for revenge. Yes, the press will be able to present it favourably. Look, an entire army has sacrificed itself for the Fuhrer and the Rake. It is your sacred duty to avenge its death. On a smaller scale we have already seen this, when in Narvik the English fleet wrecked the German destroyers. And we those who are still standing here because we feel bound by our oaths and do not know how to help ourselves, will be turned posthumously into the Nibelungs of our time. We will be eulogised as the resurrection of ancient Germanic military loyalty. We will have to serve as an example and incentive for German youth. It's the young recruits who at the beginning of the war were still rubbing their pants on their school desks, will emulate us in our madness and dazzle and rush blindly into the vast country in the east toward their own deaths, and we would be a model for them. There is no end to the thoughts, but where they lead is already becoming clear. In such times of physical and spiritual suffering as we are now experiencing, Problems are born in the brain that have never been faced before. The brain does not stop working for a moment, and then comes the realisation of the facts is are sobering and sad. Sometimes you just grab your head, when in a rare quiet moment you realise to yourself that you have fallen for the beautiful, just painted bright bait. So Goth is on his way. His strike group, consisting of several tank and infantry divisions, seeks to break through the outer ring of encirclement from the area of Kotelnikovo. Overcoming strong resistance, it is step by step moving forward. In a large bend of the Don, where the second group of German troops should move to Stalingrad, the situation has changed radically. In mid-December, large Russian forces went on the offensive on the Middle Don and pushed back the Italians and Hungarians. This operation threatens the deep flank of breaking forward the blocking army, forced to pull back forward offensive vanguards and build cut-off positions. All this constrains the actions of the command, deprives him of the ability to manoeuvre reserves. This paralyses one of the teeth of the German pincers, 
which according to the plan of the command should close. Moreover, going to the rescue troops themselves in danger of being cut off. Manstein, commander of Army Group Don, as a result of the expansion of the Russian offensive front itself, fell into a difficult situation. Now we are given only part of the attention, only half of the forces are fighting to unblock us. No one can say whether things will remain like this for long, and whether the moment will not soon come, when Gotha will have to turn the front to repel new operations of the Russians. In the cauldron itself, on the other side of the Don, the fighting is still going on with the same fierceness as before. But this is by no means the merit of the command of the Sixth Army. It is not seen or heard at all. Colonel General Paulus froze in his obedience. After all, his proposal to break through to the West was rejected. Contrary to his clearer understanding of the situation and the position of the army, he was forced to stay in the cauldron with all his troops, to hold on and day after day again and again to fight imposed by the Russians. He did not find the strength to act independently against the will of the Führer and the instructions of the strategists, commanding from behind tables with green cloth. He is silent. In fact, he has nothing to say to the troops. But his chief of staff knows only one thing. Hold on and hold on again. Hold on at any cost. At the cost of whole companies and battalions. At the cost of thousands, tens of thousands of lives. Like to the last bullet. To the last horse eaten. To the last drop of blood. That's the order. The commanders have nothing more to say to their soldiers. There's no one better to carry out such an order than the chief of staff of the 6th Army. He is the very embodiment of an officer of the German general staff of the old school, a man who knows everything, foresees everything and calculates everything in advance. Mr. Lieutenant General Schmidt, he is at Paulus Grey eminence, a man who acts from behind the scenes and never appears on the front stage, but his will is embodied in the orders that require more and more blood. In everything one feels his callousness, his unwillingness to reckon with anything, his abruptness, which everyone speaks of. He is feared, he is called the evil spirit of the army. On the front line you will never see him. For that there are division and corps commanders. And they laugh to themselves at the polished orders that Mr. Lieutenant General issues in packs. Here, ahead, the necessary measures are dictated by the opposing forces of the enemy. The weather, knowledge to the smallest detail of the studied terrain. Sometimes some small hollow, shrubbery, or the remains of a two-story building. Each commander sees for himself what to do with these orders. Meanwhile, in the city, the fight is still going on for every meter. The main objects of the battles. The factory barricade, the factory Red October with the Russian bastion. Shop number four and tennis racket. On the northern cut-off line, our divisions are engaged in the heaviest defensive battles with a continuously attacking enemy. When the idea of a breakthrough was still wandering in the headquarters, here prematurely left the old, well-equipped positions. Spartakovka and Ezovka are in enemy hands, and the defence line now runs further south over hilly terrain. The heights of Grib and Erika, and further west the ravine at Kotlubani every day witness new attacks, new counterattacks, and new losses. Only on the road Erzovka, Stalingrad on the so-called tank route, lying more than 20 hit tanks of all types. In the west, the outer fort of the fortress of Stalingrad is Merinovka, occupying in front of this village semicircular defense. The soldiers of Major Willig reflect Russian attempts to break through. The enemy is continuously strengthening. The last attack on this village was 123 rocket launchers. Nevertheless, the front is still held here. The positions in the south are also held under the same onslaught and at the cost of the same losses. The vital center of the Sixth Army is still the nursery. Here, at the airfield, airplanes land, bringing us the most necessary things. By the highest order, the supply of the 6th Army is now entrusted to General Field Marshal Milch, but our stocks of ammunition shells and fuel are so small and the emptiness in our stomachs is so great that even a general with such a nutritious name cannot fill them. Enemy air defence is visibly becoming stronger. Black clouds of bursting anti-aircraft shells encircle the boiler. In addition, the weather has worsened, the number of arriving junkers, Heinkels and Condors every day is reduced. We often see airplanes flying farther east, beyond the Volga, and not coming back. Detected by the enemy and falsely guided by him, they probably, in such weather, land somewhere on his airfields. The consequences for us are clear. The belt is tightened even tighter, motor transport is reduced even more severely, and firing on the enemy almost ceases. 
Doctors are short of patent medicines, aspirin, iodine, castor oil. You can't get cured that way, but that's no cure. In the midst of all these calamities is a general who does not want to neglect either conveniences or personal comfort. His station wagon in a camouflaged ravine is like a peaceful oasis. The parlour with its tables, chairs, curtains and drapes, all stylishly, lovingly chosen. A sliding door resembling the fur of a harmonica leads to the bedroom. Here there is a wide, inviting to rest bed of Mr. General, covered with snow-white linen. And further on, again behind the curtain, is the toilet room with a wash basin, mirrors, glass glasses and toothpaste. Despite the winter cold, it is cosy and warm. Why wonder? Outside in the open air is an iron stove. Next to it is a soldier. All day long he only does what he throws wood and makes sure that the fire does not go out. A pipe runs from this source of heat into the wagon. Mr. General may be satisfied. The whole decoration is undoubtedly stamped with skill in arrangement and refined taste. You bet, it can be strictly adhered to here. But he who lives like this, sleeping in warmth and comfort, cannot understand the needs of his soldiers. At best, he can make an understanding face, nothing more. Good night, Mr. General. Pleasant dreams. It is my humblest request, when Mr. General will indulge in dreams of his homeland, to pay my highest respects to Fra Consort and Frolin Daughter. We will gladly hold our ground and willingly die for such chiefs. With this firm conviction, Mr. General can rest in peace. To fall directly into this ideal would mean no loss to us. Right now. In the midst of all these calamities, there is another general. During the offensive of his division, he gets drunk to the point of stupefaction, so that he cannot even connect two words and can hardly give orders over the phone with a slurred tongue. The corps commander finds him in such a state at the division CP and immediately dismisses him from command. But is it possible to send a general home so easily? No, it's no good. The division doctor and the doctors of the medical company are in a quandary, but then they find a way out. The general is given a medical report. The wound received in the First World War causes him terrible pain, and therefore he has to constantly resort to nicotine and alcohol. Thus, Mr. General can proudly go to his homeland with an unstained vest and receive honours there as a hero of Stalingrad. Ah, Mr. General, we will miss you so much with your image of a soldier slaughterer, with your well-deserved by others, Knight's Cross and your always full glass. So far, the two generals are the exception. Their subordinates are our camaraderie, and they are beginning to spit on gold-embroidered red collars. The distance due to education, rank and command power is increasingly disappearing in this stormy, th the epaulettes and polished mind are increasingly beginning to give way to the voice of the heart. Christmas is coming. There is no talk of holidays this time. There is no reason for it. Even a tree is not easy to get here, and not even a Christmas tree. In the end, an old pine tree can replace a Christmas tree. But even it can be found only after a long search. No wonder there are so few trees in the steppe. Besides, the weather is cold, and there is not enough firewood. Everything that was at hand was cut down long ago, cut down and burned in stoves. We should be glad that there is something at all. Berger takes up decorating. He takes up the task with a knife and scissors, diligently cuts out figures, stars and all sorts of things. Yes, it's going to be a sad Christmas in the cauldron. No presents, no surprises, only maybe from the Russians, and the field mail is unlikely to deliver anything to us. It has essentially ceased to operate. True, sometimes it manages to send some news from the cauldron to the homeland with a transport plane, but it happens rarely. It must be very lucky and from there one sack of mail arrives at best. Last month I received a single letter and I know that my wife writes to me daily. It is horrible while still alive to slowly die to the outside world. Once in a while there is some sign of life, some reminder of yourself, and then you are silent forever. We are already off the stage of world history, though still alive, though we have never stood so sharply illuminated by the light of its ramp as we do now. The whole world is watching us, anxiously awaiting the outcome of this battle, which in its severity, its duration, the number of troops involved and its decisive significance is unrivaled. And yet we still have only the last threads of connection with the outside world, but the outside world has not forgotten us. This is evidenced by the increasing enemy artillery every day. It is evidenced by the radio calling on us to hold out to the last man. It is evidenced by the decreasing supply by air every day. We have nothing. Soon we won't even have the strength to shout for help. 
For all of us sitting in a mouse trap, Paulus is doing it. He radios day after day. Help, help. It's the only sign of life we have, and this SOS signal reflects exactly what we think about day and night. The will to live is not yet broken in us. It's broken, yes, but we don't want to die. Even if they keep telling us that we are an example of the heroism of the German soldier, and our death is honourable. Franz came to see me today at an unusual time. He is excited, completely out of control, swearing and shouting so that I do not even immediately understand what is the matter. It turns out he was furious about a letter, one of the few we still get. Oh no, I'm not that stupid. The trick will not work. Transfer me to Dnipropetrovsk. Mr. Captain, isn't this unheard of piggishness? I start asking questions. Franz answers, then shows me the letter. It's clearly and understandably. The firm in which he served before mobilization into the army transfers him for the first three years after the war as an engineer in Demipropetrovsk. Objections are useless. And now, please obey. What did I fight for here? To be exiled like a modern-day slave. I'm not some cannon fodder like the Romanians who die here for us. What does for us mean exactly? Until today I believed. That's why I took part in this circus, even when I was sick to my stomach. I told myself this is good for all of us. That's why I got involved. But here it is written in black and white. We are as much a tool for others as these Romanians, Italians, Croats, and all these auxiliary peoples. I can't remember the names. I voluntarily return to the front, and these fat belied people sit in the rear and decide to transfer me to Russia after the war. Is it worth coming home after the victory? Grab your stuff and go back to a foreign country? I'm trying to calm him down. The last word hasn't been said yet. We'll find out when we get home. No, it's all cleared up for me today, right now. Right this minute. Let them kiss me on the one by one and crosswise. I'm not risking my head to be exiled to the wilderness at the end. I'll show them all. If I come back, let them beware. I'll pay you back. I'll start at the top with these people. They sent us to conquer this country so they could reap the rewards. And I'm fed up. You can't calm him down. He leaves as excited as he came. This one's already cured. He was so convinced of the rightness of his views. He always is. Fanatics of his kind only sober up when they're grabbed by the throat. Others learn faster. They see the injustices done to their comrades and draw conclusions for themselves, at least in the main. Be that as it may, discontent with Hitler and the top of the German state is growing, and it is in us, in those who are portrayed in their homeland as an example for others, a truly incomprehensible, blatant contradiction. But there must be a way out, or maybe this contradiction is insoluble as long as our thoughts have not yet shed their long-worn baby shoes. That's what a non-commissioned officer from the Engineer Sapper Supply Platoon said to me the other day when I went into Luke's company last week to see what was going on. This corporal was sitting at a table with two other soldiers. They were talking about the cauldron, and when I walked in, began asking me questions that demanded clear answers from me. I tried as far as possible to skirt the underwater reefs, but the three men were not satisfied with my answers. They took a rather reasonable view of things. It was clear that they adhered only to facts and rejected all excuses, and moreover that they thought quite differently from what was allowed in Germany. Pretending not to notice this, I went out. I would have reacted quite differently before. There is no doubt about it. It means, it is quite clear, that I myself am no longer the same as I was a few years or even months ago. The next day, December 21, we have a festive service in a small hollow. The prayer is over, the blessing is pronounced. People disperse. After brief wishes, the divisional priest also leaves. Thus, in fact, Christmas is over. But for me, and probably for many others, it is not over. Memories come back to me more and more strong. Years, months, days, and the very last minutes pass before me mentally. The architect from our street, thrown into a concentration camp, Rominger, the mood in Germany, Seidlitz, Tony, and now the Pater, they surround me. They come from all walks of life here and back home. And they're all unhappy with what's going on. They swear loudly, they wail, they send radiograms for help, they whisper and pass on rumours to each other by word of mouth. There is probably no one among us who is satisfied with everything right now. Not that I know of, anyway. But then why do we put up with this oppression? To live the way we don't want to live? Why do we obediently, with all the zeal of service, carry out the orders we are given? Is it only war an unusual condition? That makes us do this? 
After long negotiations with our Wani, after all this waterfall of words that fell on me, I still managed to get permission from him to visit our wounded at the divisional infirmary. All right, my blessing. If you want to go, go. Leave Feidler in charge. Quickly fill up the car with the last drops of gasoline. If we don't get more gasoline and Glock doesn't have it by chance, or if the mine fuel exchange doesn't burn out, we'll soon be done with travelling by car. We'll have to travel only on foot. But there is enough gasoline for today. Immediately after breakfast I leave together with the doctor. We stuffed in our pockets a few bars of chocolate, tubes of candy, cigarettes and the last letters delivered by field mail, only twenty of them for a hundred of our wounded, who had to stay in the cauldron. Chocolates are only given to those in close combat. But we managed to save up a little, as it is always given according to the number of active bayonets as of yesterday, and during that time someone is always killed. I saved these little things especially for today's trip. They're real gems, more expensive than whole chocolate sets back home. Our first objective is the Divisional Medical Center. It's located halfway to Razguyevka. They are capital buildings, a former school with annexes. They are located high up and can be seen from afar. We can't get to the entrance. We have to get out of the car before we reach the entrance 50 meters away. A lot of sledges, trucks, wagons bringing the wounded sick, frostbitten. Some waddle by themselves, others are led under the arms, most are carried on stretchers. One by one, they are sent to the emergency room. Here is a long line, the end of which is not visible. Young and old officers and soldiers, seriously and slightly wounded. Many died on the way. To the right of the large building stretches a snow wall, two and a half meters high and thirty meters long. There is a narrow passage in it. Through it the orderlies carry out the dead, then with empty stretchers return for the next one. The ground is hard, the shovels are blunt, the labor force is absent, and those who are available are too weak. The matter is simplified. The dead are piled with snow. Snowdrifts grow, so that here they lie, the dead petrified by the frost, stretched out or curled up, without legs, without arms, with bandaged heads, with eyes closed or staring up at the sky, with clenched fists or distorted faces, grinning yellow teeth in open mouth. Death had made them all the same, stooped cheeks, bodies skinny with hunger. No sooner had a man breathed his last breath than four hands grabbed him, the dead man was dragged from his bunk to make room for the others who were already waiting outside. Here, in silence, the dead man is thrown in with the others, already obediently lying in silent formation. A couple of shovels of snow and the next one can be taken up. A sinister monument of human grief and suffering, of deliverance from terror, coercion and persecution, grows up to the sky. It is still hidden from human gaze behind the snowbank, but it grows higher and higher, unstoppable. Every hour, those who stand before it today, tomorrow perhaps, will themselves lie in the next layer, and the day will come when everyone who passes by will see this mountain of stiffened corpses, and such thought-provoking monuments grow cautionary in many places. Wherever there is a white flag with a red cross, this flag, which promises help and salvation, has become a symbol of powerlessness here. Dr. Blankmeister, commander of the sanitary company, stands at the entrance and takes in the parade of the doomed. Pale yellow, with an almost absent look, he extends his hand to me. I can see that he is falling off his feet from fatigue. He complains to me of his sorrows. At first, the wounded could still be evacuated to a field hospital, and some of them by transport plane even to the deep rear. Now it's all over. All the rooms are crammed with wounded and sick. Each place has two or three people. It is swarming with soldiers, officers, doctors, wounded, sick. Right on the floor, in semi-darkness, in the draft lie endless rows of seriously wounded, between the stretchers can not even pass. In the stinking air there are moans and complaints, sobs and sighs. Suddenly there is a violent shout, and again behind, where it is completely dark. The soldiers are screaming in pain, calling for a doctor, shouting, swearing, cursing everything in the world. One is praying, the other only shouts, Shit, stinking shit. John tries to get attention with a commanding tone. Others beg and nag. Some lie with their eyes closed, apathetic and listless, probably unconscious. Right there and dying, waiting, hoping, while help in white coats passes by. Two orderlies take the dead man by the legs and arms, carry him out into the snowy carriage, to where others are already lying under the snow. A place is vacated. New stretches are brought in, and voices of different strength still drown each other. 
young and quite childish, boyish, then low basses. When one hears this bacchanalier of prayers, blasphemies, appeals to wife and mother, and the foulest of trench swear words, one feels as if one has entered a madhouse. Here, as in, and there, heaven and hell are neighbours, and so it is everywhere. In a long, primitively equipped room is what in normal conditions is called an operating room. Tables and two folding tables with brown rubber oil cloth, prehistoric dumps that belong only in a museum. Surgical instruments and dressings are spread out on a school bench. To the left, in a locker without doors, medicines in front of him, basin for washing. And both operating tables day and night work is going on. Three doctors in blood-splattered coats looking at no one and nothing. There is no shift for them. They cut, saw, amputate until they collapse from fatigue. In a month, 1,500 people pass through this room. You can imagine the extraordinary amount of energy doctors need to cope with such a flow. In addition, many do not just have gunshot wounds or frostbite when a single movement of a knife is enough. Most are wounded in close combat, and their bodies are strewn with many hand grenade fragments that must be patiently retrieved. Others are so mangled by aerial bombs and shells that amputation is necessary. Many cases require hours of great exertion and self-sacrifice on the part of doctors. An adjacent room, a former school classroom, is occupied by those suffering from starvation-induced exhaustion. Here the doctors have to meet with such unknown phenomena as swellings of all kinds and body temperatures below 34 degrees. Those who have died of starvation are carried out every hour and laid in the snow. Very little food is given to the emaciated, mostly boiling water and a little horse meat, but only once a day. Blankmeister himself has to travel to all the nearby units and food stores to get something to eat. Sometimes you can't get anything. Bread is almost forgotten here. It is barely enough for those in the trenches and guards. They are entitled to 800 calories a day, a starvation ration on which you can only last a few weeks. And yet the wounded, lying huddled in this abode of grief, envy those who do. We pass through all the rooms walking from bunk to bunk. There's some Christmas greenery on the walls. Some of the bunks have pictures, wedding and family photos, wives and children looking at someone who is almost immovable, and he himself is quiet, eyes closed, a peacefulness already on his face. Others have pulled the blankets over their heads. They don't want to see or hear anything. They are fleeing from reality, but the reality does not let them out of its clutches. From under the blankets you can hear moans, sobs, invisible tears pouring there. Today on Christmas Day, on this holiday of love and joy, they would like to cry out their pain to this feral world where the words peace on earth are mocked. Their hearts bleed, but their lips are tight. They know that their neighbour is going through the same thing. They know no one can help them. No camaraderie, no doctor, no God. In the evening the priest is due to arrive to bless them on the occasion of Christmas. Some take the news with joy. Others don't care whether he comes or not, and some even openly express their reluctance. Let them be left alone. They know in advance what the pater will say. They don't want to hear it. Let them be left alone with their own sufferings and thoughts under their blankets, with their eyes closed and their ears plugged. And his soldiers are among them. In every corner one sees a familiar face. I exchange short words of greeting, shake their hands a sweaty, powerless, dead cold, Death has already come for some. Each receives a gift. Some receive a letter, a greeting from a distant home, where they remember him with love and fear for his fate. The letters are almost snatched out of their hands, frantically opened, run their eyes, swallowing tears with difficulty. And the unfamiliar soldier lying next to him squirms in pain. He sees only chocolate, something edible. He is hungry, and no one has taken care of him. I'm talking to a soldier from the third company, and his neighbour is looking for lice. Nothing in the world interests him any more. Concentrating, he clicks one after another, 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 without paying any attention to us. In the headboard hangs his uniform with officer's epaulets, uber lieutenant. In the next room a shot rattles. Among the thirty other wounded on a bunk in his own blood lies a lieutenant, a young twenty-year-old guy. His right arm hangs down impotently, a pistol lying on the floor. Lightly wounded reports Blankmeister, who has come running in. Yeah, maybe. Here in this city, it's not just bullets and splinters that tear the heart. From behind, someone is raving in delirium, a cramped mouth shouting orders, cursing, yelling. Everyone must die with dignity, as they should. 
a monocle gleams on his angular face. On the edge of the bunk sits a clerk and strokes his commander's left arm. His right arm is gone. His shins are shattered. It'll be over by morning, Blankmeister says. The rounds are over. Now I understand why the doctors and orderlies are so exhausted, why they are so apathetic and sometimes even insensitive and heartless. He who works here day and night tirelessly must have nerves like wire ropes. It becomes deaf to suffering and pain. To pleas and complaints ceases to notice wounds and blood. To him they are no longer people. To him they are cases, only cases, abdominal wound, lung wound, crushing. Gives orders, amputate, operate, bandage, and after examining some of them says, we can't help them, they'll die anyway. Here they mechanically register, mechanically work, mechanically move on to the next case, and in the end the doctor himself becomes a machine. This is natural. At parting, Blankmeister tells me that some men of my battalion are lying at the dressing station on the other side of the Tatar rampart. He happened to hear about it from another doctor. Since I want to visit all my wounded if possible, we go there. We've saved some chocolate and a couple of cigarettes, so we won't come empty-handed. Not a quarter of an hour goes by and we're there. Everything looks different from Blankmeister's, not just because there's no white flag with a red cross, a small signpost and trampled paths and a snowbank tell us that there is a kind of infirmary here. The whole dressing station is located underground, dugout after dugout, and in front of them some pathetic shadows, skeletons, on which the skin barely holds on. The commander of the sanitary company also tells me that because of the lack of space cannot take new wounded. The frostbitten ones haven't been taken for a week. Because there's no ointment, the dead are stacked in a snowdrift here too. We see them as we follow the young doctor captain into the operating room. Several crates stacked together with oilcloth draped over them. An automobile headlight casts light on a groaning soldier. From the tools I notice only an iron saw, obviously taken from the emergency aircraft equipped. Two surgeons are attending to the wounded man. Their gowns resemble butchers' clothes from weeks of where they have become grey and yellow, covered with brownish-brown stains. One takes an ampoule, wants to give an injection but the liquid is frozen. The ampoule has to be warmed in his mouth. Although the tin trough is burning with flames, down here it is dog cold. The frozen earth walls are covered only by thin planks. The assistant holds out a syringe. The operation begins. The doctor makes a circular incision with a scalpel. I do not have time to wait for the end of the operation, and I go looking for the men of my battalion. I go from one dugout to another, as at the division infirmary, there are a few green branches somewhere for Christmas. Everywhere we are greeted with curious looks. And when we find any of our soldiers, their faces light up with joy. For them our arrival is a Christmas present. For many it's the last joy, because they die here too. Doctors and orderlies are so overloaded that they notice the deceased only a few hours after death. During their rounds we get into a dugout, obviously intended for the likely wounded. Some lie on bunks, others wander about stumbling and grasping for air apparently due to hunger and general weakness. There is no answer to my greeting, nor do they answer my questions. A field sanitary officer hurriedly leads us away from there. Mr. Captain, these are men with head wounds. No one can help these poor people any more. Sterile dressings are all we can do for them now. It's a suicide dugout. But sometimes they still live a day or two, get on their feet, wander around the dugout, no longer conscious of anything. In farewell, I would like to wish the doctor a Merry Christmas and ask him to pay a little attention to my men. In the doctor's dugout, there is a blinded soldier. Now he will be bandaged. The comrades who brought him in have quietly disappeared. The poor man stands like a foundling, groping objects with his hands, searching, helpless. It turns out, moreover, that he has been robbed of everything he had. In despair, he laments and cries, weeping for friendship and comradeship in which he believed for his fate and for everything in the world. After all this, is it really worth living? It is especially bitter to realise this today, on Christmas Day. On the way back, I can't help thinking about what I've seen. We can write off our wounded. We can write off not only our battalion, but the whole army. We used to receive more or less large replenishments only at the expense of convalescence from hospitals, but that's a thing of the past now too. But what can be done in a cauldron where we, so to speak, Cut the bow on which we are sitting. By writing off our wounded, we wrote off ourselves. In my dugout, I'm in for more surprises. Two young officers are assigned to the battalion. They report their arrival. Lieutenant Tush and Lieutenant Hurtun. 
Both our fly-ins, that's what we now call all officers and soldiers airlifted to the cauldron. They came to the kennel from the Don officers' reserve. They tell about the confusion in the area of Milarovo and Voronezh, but nevertheless are full of the brightest hopes. Judging by everything they know, Goth has enough forces to get through to us. It's only a matter of days. Both of them are willingly prepared to put up with a little inconvenience, in the full confidence and proud consciousness that they too will be at these joyous events. She is only a week old from Berlin and can tell the latest news about what is going on in Germany. There they have no idea of the catastrophe that is already looming here. They only know about the Red Army's winter offensive. Yes, of course, they talk about it, but disparagingly, of course. No idea of the scale of it, of the events on the Don, of our encirclement, and Tush and Hurchin themselves only in Rostov received clear information about the situation. They imagine the boiler as someone who has never looked into it in his life. In their opinion, our defence front is stable, ammunition stocks are huge, and food supply is sufficient. Of course, some things may be lacking, but in general quite well, in Haird Hurton even declares categorically, well, I will never eat horse meat. I leave it to Berger to enlighten both flyers about the actual situation. They can do it, and move on to the next unexpected Christmas present. I am presented with another officer, an elderly Oberlutent, Short in stature, frail in build, he's from a construction battalion that worked somewhere in the northern cut-off positions. Surname Luneburg or something, I couldn't hear. He's here on behalf of his commanding officer to report to me at Flowerpot tomorrow morning. Three companies of the battalion. He asks for instructions as to where they're to be stationed. Yes, I suppose my army will soon grow into a small division. The remnants of my battalion, a company of bakers, a cattle platoon, both companies of Romanians, and now these three construction companies. If it goes on like this, soon there will be no ravines nearby to accommodate all the soldiers in small dugouts. So far, it's still working. The construction battalion will have to be placed near the Romanians. Amy goes to show the place to the Obelutni. But a third surprise awaits me. The table is decorated with greenery. In the centre are several rows of malt candies. Next to it are Christmas cards from officers, non-commissioned officers and enlisted men. It's Christmas Day, and we're in such trouble. Everyone is busy with only themselves from morning till evening and sometimes midnight everyone's heart is heavy, and yet they thought of me. They didn't forget. I am happier at this moment than if in peacetime I'd received a ticket for a round-the-world trip as a present. Berger tells how he managed to get malt candy. Not far from shop, no. Seven, in an open area slightly covered, stands a vat with a syrupy viscous mass, although this point is viewed by the enemy and is regularly shelled by machine gun fire. Soldiers keep running there with canisters, filling them with the black liquid. At the same time there are losses, the infantry three killed, and we, just one wounded in the then we decided to try to make something out of this liquid. We boiled it with double the amount of water, cooled it, poured the thickened mass on an iron shield, fried it, cut it into quadrangular pieces. The product of this creativity is malt candy. I try one. The taste of mineral oil is still there, but it is sweet, and still at least some treat. On the occasion of the holiday were issued double portions of food. Everyone in the battalion got two large beets and a full pot of soup. It's the only thing we can do. Evening comes, Christmas Eve. One by one the officers from the old companies come in, the battalion intendants from the nursery. We sit down at a small table, a pine tree instead of a Christmas tree, burning candles, Christmas singing from the radio and green branches create a festive mood. But the conversation does not go well, although we share our memories of the Christmas war days on the Seya, on the Marne and on the Donuts. We also remember how we spent Christmas with our families. Then, four years ago and even earlier in peacetime, the conversation stops every now and then. They look at the burning candles, inhale the pine smell, move back to the wall in the semi-darkness behind the neighbour's back, and their thoughts go far away toward home. It is eight o'clock in the evening. The relatives are all sitting together and looking at the candles too, just as we are. They are now passing my picture to each other, thinking of me. But how? Is it with the same pride? Do they believe that we stand victoriously on the Volga, holding the banner high? Perhaps they still do. I remember how happy my mother was when she first saw me in an officer's uniform, but a lot has changed since then. 
we've been at war for four years. Stain doesn't everything else. All the hardships and worries recede into the background today before one such understandable wish. That the holiday of peace on earth should really become a holiday of peace, before the desire to be with my beloved son on this day. Yes, I understand it well. I imagine my mother waiting in vain for a letter from me today, her eyes watering. She will seek comfort from my wife to help her through these difficult hours. My wife will try to appear stronger than she is, I know her. But they back home have no reason to think of us with any special sadness today. They don't know anything about the cauldron. Tush just confirmed that. And they know even less about the conditions we are in. Hunger, fatigue, perpetual close combat, mass graves and corpses behind the snow berm. The German people will only learn about these things later, when everything is behind them. But even now, when they do not know about it yet, grief will quietly penetrate into many homes where the Christmas tree with lighted candles stands, and this grief will point its finger out. Words of comfort will be spoken, hopes will be cherished for a reunion. They will look at the photo and say to themselves, let us not despair. After all, he will surely come back. After all, nothing has happened to him so far. He is lucky. There is no need to be afraid. But he himself, a captain in Stalingrad, has no time to indulge in all these thoughts. It is 21.0, and Goebbels has just started his Christmas speech. The dugout becomes even quieter. By the voice of the orator, one can feel how annoyed he is that he can't tell the whole listening Germany the victorious news about the situation on the fronts. He has to admit, although I usually do not go into my pocket for words, today I do not have enough. But he still has enough of them to bring down a waterfall on his listeners, to fill the eyes of mothers and wives with new tears, to bring confusion into their souls and at the same time try to strengthen confidence in the leadership of the Reich, exhorting everyone and everything not to think, because the courage of the heart in a time of war should be valued more than clever intellect. And, as if in mockery of our situation, he ends with a sweet voice quoting Holderlin. The messengers are flying. We have won the battle. Live, O motherland, and count not the fallen. With a bitter feeling we listen to this meaningless speech. Goebbels, who for many years was able to turn defeats into successes on paper and mask disappointment with high-flown words, has nothing to say to us today. We know that a turning point has come for us, and now it is all a matter of understanding this and acting accordingly, of realizing that fate has long been testing us, whether we are really called to lead the whole world. Yes, that's right. Fate has been testing us since the last days of August, and the preliminary results of this test have long been known in the Führer's headquarters, only they are not published, and Goebbels also withheld them today. The time I wanted to talk to you has expired. Yes, that's right. Time is up, and for us too. Standing before me is the Romanian Captain Popescu. Totally distraught and crying, he tells me the tragic news. His racehorse is dead, the very one for whom a special stable was built, and for whom the stableman always took a nap. Half an hour ago the captain found him tied up on the straw, with Mademoiselle's head lying beside him, and her hooves cut off, which were all that was left of her. I can't help him. Moreover, the valet has not identified anyone, but only says that it was the Germans. Our conversation is interrupted by a telephone call. Alert, the Russians broke through at the shop number two, all forces there. Then it's business as usual. Movement of units to the front line, reconnaissance, combat readiness, counter- With the last ammunition we beat back the old trenches. In the first hours of the new day I'm back in my dugout. Positions occupied by infantry. Franz with 50 soldiers stayed there as reinforcements. The rest are withdrawing. We have two dead. Emig is wounded but lightly a tangential wound to the arm. That's what Christmas is all about. But it's a good thing it turned out this way. Maybe it'll be quiet for a few days. We are advancing for that and for the dugout, for a roof over our heads. The lowest basement corridor is a splendid place compared to a hole in the snow. At 20 to 30 degrees of frost for that it is worth going on the counter-attack, shooting and rushing forward, and everything else is indifferent. And suddenly I feel that I can no longer. Let others do what they want. Today at least I want to be alone. I can't listen any more. Do you remember? Do you still remember? It's all empty talk. I want to celebrate Christmas alone with my thoughts. But in the morning, a Russian breakthrough at night makes me think. It would be better to move the construction battalion closer to the front line, to have a reserve on hand in case of unforeseen incidents. Perhaps in the White House neighborhood, 
there will be a few basements there to house soldiers. There you can move more or less inconspicuously, and the units there can be dropped to the front line at any minute, if necessary. It's only a few hundred meters away. I'm going to take a look for myself. Burgers with me. We survey the whole area, we run from house to house, from ruin to ruin, from entrance to entrance, then we go up the stairs, then we go down. Berger has a field book in his hands, he enters every empty cellar in it. Some cellars are completely dirty, some are half collapsed, but everything can be put in order. We can not longer search and choose. Here we need to canton the whole battalion. We need every available hole. We are counting. There are not enough cellars. We go down to one of the cellars again. We open the door, we see a dim light. Someone's here. My pocket flashlights out. Berger lights a match. My God, this huge cellar is packed to the brim with soldiers. Everywhere you look, there are soldiers. Romanians, Germans, Croats, Germans again. They lie stretched out on the floor or leaning against the walls, cramped together. Nobody moves. They look at us, but no one opens his mouth, does not utter a word, does not react to our arrival. I cask one of the Germans. What unit are you from? He yawns in my face, looks past me, and doesn't even think of answering. Another match. Answer immediately. What unit? Now we get an answer. And get out of here and don't bother us. We didn't invite anyone and we don't want to see anyone? What? Answer my question. Well, if you must know, we've had enough of this shit. We don't want to lay down our bones anymore. No way. We'd rather die here, but in peace. Now you know that, so get the fuck out of here. I explode with indignation, but I realize I'm actually trying to hit the wall with my head. No one pays any attention to me. But that's desertion, treason, against others who are still fighting. Berger is lighting what must be his twentieth match. I only want to determine approximately how many soldiers are here, and I move on to the next cellar. Berger follows me. We step on someone's hands, trip over someone's feet, fumble with every step we take. There's a flurry of swearing and cursing pigs, you animals, thrown in our faces. The noise is as if the whole mob is about to pounce on us, but only a few people shout. The bulk of them lie and sit perfectly still, don't even move. Berger lights a match again, someone comes up to us and blows it out. Total darkness. And now I feel someone else's hand in every pocket of my overcoat. Everything happens in an instant. Mr. Captain, help. My clothes are being torn off, shouts behind me my adjutant. There is nothing to think about. I strike with my fists and feet wherever I can, shake off those who are holding me, strike back, and make my way forward. I manage to get free quickly, but I can still hear the horse struggle behind me. I rush to the rescue. A few blows with my fists and feet on the rolling heap, and now Berger, too, is free. Somewhere in the depths a candle lights up. Only now we see how huge this dungeon is. At least a hundred men are hiding here. There, at the far end, where the light has come on, a terrible scene is taking place. It's without paying any attention to us. Three soldiers are beating a fourth. The only thing visible is the thick stick with which they beat him. Then the three pounce on the fallen man and strip him naked. They tear off everything, not even his undershirt. The predatory gleam of their eyes is visible to us. No one rises to the defense of the beaten man. Everyone lies as if nothing had happened. Complete apathy, the sobs of the beaten man. Through the darkness we rush there right over feet, hands, bodies, and heads. We are met with a stick. Berger's glasses fly off. But we don't back down, and two minutes later the stick is in our hands. I'm throwing punches in all directions. With the stick, we're finally making our way out. That worked out better than I thought. Only a few hands are trying to hold us back. And the rest, as before, lie and sit motionless. This is the grave of the buried alive. These are soldiers who once went to war, soldiers who once won in Poland, Norway, France, the Balkans, and at first they no longer believe we can get out of here. They have already ended their lives, these men in their twenties and forties who have their families waiting at home. I should have reminded them of their camaraderie, but I immediately think of the infirmary, and I don't feel like yelling anymore. Here as there they lie just as huddled together, miserable, hopeless. Here they are just as written off as there, with the difference that there is still registration at the tatter shaft. If it weren't for that, the basement could well be mistaken for some kind of ward for the mentally ill. And this basement is not the only one where such people have found refuge. After all, not only one of our divisions, but the entire Sixth Army. What will happen next? And who is responsible for all this? The command? Yes, of course. 
It is it that has always only ordered, demanded, driven forward. It is it that made us starve, saying that only for a few days. It is it that withheld from us what it knew or should have foreseen. And us, the other officers. Did we ourselves say anything to the soldiers about our doubts? 